Hi everyone from me, Brent Graham, and welcome to the Stage 8 betting preview of the Tour de France. We'll also have a look back at what was an thrilling Stage 7, one of the great stages of all time, in my opinion, and the latest betting markets. Well, who would have thought uh, that that 250-kilometer stage on Friday would end up having the yellow jersey in a 29-man break with Vaud van Aert, who was just 30 seconds behind him. It was a frantic start to the race, and it was clear that there was going to be some form of strong break getting away in the end, despite the fact that there were many times where you could see that uh, some of the teams were quite keen to just let a non-threatening break go up the road. I did mention a couple of stages back that this race wasn't over, and the reason I said that was because Podjokar is the strongest rider but he's got a decent team, but a team that isn't built for a two-week defense of the Tour de France yellow jersey. Now, he wasn't even in yellow yesterday, but the owners certainly fell on him to defend, no doubt about that. And it was quickly shown that his team were going to struggle in these kind of situations. Anyway, we had the 29-man break go clear. And in the end, I'm, I'm, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to just take this banner down now, and we'll go and have a look at the, at the standings. I've, I was just checking out the green jersey points there, but uh, let's go to the stage ranking. And in the end, it was uh, Moric who broke away on one of the climbs and rode away to victory, a brilliant victory. And I know a number of guys, including including at Kruit Lem on Twitter, were on him as a potential breakaway victor. Jasper Staven, what a quality ride from a man who's not known for his climbing ability. One minute 20 behind Magnus Court Nielsen. He, ran, he won the race for third there. I was pleased. It keeps my EF education team in the team hunt as well. I backed them at 20 to 1. Uh, Matteo van der Poel, what a brilliant ride by him. He certainly didn't look superhuman yesterday, which he sometimes does. But my word, the big guy got himself over the 250 kilometers and he's got his uh, yellow jersey lead over Vote van Aert maintained and pulled, obviously, a few more minutes on the other guy. So that's not going to last, though, and I suspect he will lose that jersey today one way or another. Um, as far as the favourites go, Carapaz attacked late on the final climb. A bit disappointing. Some of the other guys didn't try and uh, put Podjokar under pressure at that stage. But he was caught on the run into the finish, and there was no real change amongst uh, the big GC boys there. The big exception, of course, is a Primoz Roglic. Those injuries clearly played a massive role, and unfortunately he fell probably out of contention, unless he can make a dramatic quick recovery and get used in some breakaways late in the race. But you'd have to say that's the end of it for Roger. Here's the updated standings. Van der Poel, he's uh, 30 seconds ahead of Vaud van Aert. And you then go back 149 to Kasper Askreen, another man I'm sure we'll see try to get into the break today. Tadej Pojokar, the first of the real GC men here. He's uh, sitting 343 behind. To someone watching the Tour de France for a first time, they may say 3 minutes 43. That's a long time. Not in this race. It's not going to be a long time. There's a good chance that in the end of the day, Podjokov could win the race by that sort of margin, the way he is going at the moment. All right, let's quickly have a look at the updated betting. Then I'm just popping on to Sunbet here. General classification, no real change there. Four to nine, Podjokov, slight drift. He was around the one to three mark. I think uh, the vulnerability of his team has been seen, but there's still the feeling that he is the strongest man in the race and will be able to handle things. Carapaz, seven to one. Yeah, I was very impressed the fact that Ineos didn't help chase the break yesterday. They, they they really used that opportunity to put the UAE under pressure. Something in the past which I felt teams haven't done to Ineos when Ineos have had the yellow jersey and potentially been the strongest team in the race. Wout van Aert, he's 11 to 1. I still can't have him for the win, but he's a good climber. And uh, yeah, you know, he's not going to be easy to shrug off necessarily in the mountains. His teammate Vingard there is 16 to 1. I don't think there's much value in scrolling much further at this stage. The mountain classification today is going to be interesting for that. We're going to see some big movement. I definitely wouldn't back a project card today at, at 8 to 1 for the mountains because I think a break is going to take most of the points, if not all of the points, on the mountain stage. I see Quintana there, 8 to 1. He had a bad day yesterday, but he said he wasn't feeling great. If that's the case, hard to see how he's going to bounce back today, but he'll certainly be trying to get back into the break, as will Martin. He'll definitely be looking to get into the break. In fact, he said... He wants to get into today's break. Carapaz there at 10 to 1. Probably worth scrolling down the, the list a bit just to see if there's anyone else who catches the eye. I haven't really uh, I haven't really got too involved in this. Yates is another who should be in the break today. He was there yesterday as well. And at Lopez is a chance he could go in the early break, but I'm expecting probably more of a late attack from him. Let's go just have a quick squeeze at the other markets. There's not going to be much change in this one, probably overnight, uh, the green jersey. Cavendish now 7-10. to 10. He is far ahead. It looks like it's his jersey to lose. And the question is how he's going to handle the mountains, I believe. He picked up 20 bonus points yesterday by being in that break. And it can be interesting to see how he handles that. 7-10 to 10 
may well look a very good price, but I still think at the end of the day, Cavendish is going to battle to see out the three weeks. We'll see about that, though. The team classification is looking pretty exciting. I did suggest Moby Stoll will lay it below even money. They've gone out to 16 to 10. They're about 12 minutes back. Also, nothing in this competition ahead of the Ineos Grenadiers, Yambo Visma, and Trek Segafredo. I won't scroll down, but EF are sitting around the 16 to 1 mark at the moment. Let's get into the stage, though. It's going to be an absolute thriller. Bear in mind, we've got some tired, tired legs in the race. Yesterday was a brute of the stage. It was hot. It was 250 kilometers. It was unbelievable. And here we've got a stage that starts with a nice climb here, which can allow a very strong break to get away. And I want to come back to the, to the start of the stage now because I think it's going to be absolutely crucial. We've then got more of a, a sort of a flatter sort of section, and you start getting into the categorized climb. Six and a half kilometers at 4%. 2.7 at 4.9. Okay, that's not that heavy. 5.7 at 8.3, and here we go. So that's the first of the cat ones. And we got 8.8 at 8.9. I mean, that is a serious climb. And you don't get much respite, and you enter the final climb 7.5 at 8.5%. Is then a descent into the finish. Those uh, veteran cycling fans like me will remember uh, Lance Armstrong stamping his authority and beating a Cloden in a, in a sprint finish. He came from behind him, if I remember correctly, to pip him on the line many, many years ago, 2004. That's the finish we've got here. Philippe has also won on this finish as well. But having a look at this uh, start here, we could be in for a fascinating stage today. Uh, you know, often in cycling, you expect a, a fascinating stage and it doesn't work out, but I just don't see how we don't get action today because there's no doubt about it. Uh, Pogica is the strongest rider in the race and the team simply have to put him under pressure. And the only way that they can put him under pressure really is to put his team under pressure. So I'm expecting a frantic race to get into the break. I don't know if it'll go as early as this first sort of rise up to the five kilometer mark here. And we might have fight all the way along the sort of uh, uh, flatter roads here, although it does look quite rolling. And we might get something going perhaps on this Cat 3 climb. Who's going to go into the break? Who's going to try and get into the break? Obviously, you're going to have climbers like uh, Ben O'Connor. You're going to have Simon Yates. You're going to have uh, uh, Martin. They're going to look to get into the break, and I think they will probably be successful. But what's going to fascinate me about this stage and what I'm really hoping for is that the likes of Ineos and uh, Yamo Visma look, and, and even Astana as well, look to put some people into the break who are not that far behind on general classification. Now, it's one of these scenarios, by the time you get to the third week of the race, you know, your guy is sitting in 10th position is normally 15 minutes back. And frankly, if he gets into a break, the, the, the favorite for the race is not going to be bothered. But you've got a situation now that's probably just worth having a quick look at the overall classification. Um, we obviously go down. Uh, Alex Litsenko, for example, not really a contender for the title, but he might he might sneak into the break. But I'll tell you what I'm thinking of. We've got Ineos here. You've got Thomas sitting 529 back. He doesn't look to have the condition to attack at this point. He battled a bit yesterday as well. But um, there's a couple of guys who could put who could put um, UAE under real pressure. And uh, where's my man, uh, Richie Port? There he is, Port now. He's only in 25th position. He's 7.33 behind, but that's only four minutes behind Podjokar. Now, if, surely Ineos are going to try and get Richie Port in the break. He's looking pretty strong. And if he's in the break, it's going to force Podjokar's team to work hard all day long. And that's exactly what the teams are going to be looking to do at that stage. If they can then get Podjokar to the mountains or the final climb, with only one teammate, maybe no teammates, they're going to put him under a tremendous amount of pressure attacking. Of course, if you get to the final climb with Podjokar, he will probably attack himself and use <laughs> use that as a means of his defense because that's how good he is. I am wondering, though, if he had a bit of an off day yesterday as well. I know his team were put under pressure, but I was a little bit surprised that he didn't sort of go off the carapaz straight away. He tends to be in his nature. I think he did the right thing by not going off the carapaz, and that was proven anyway when, when carapaz was caught. But I do sort of wonder, you know, has he was that a slight indication that he wasn't quite at his strongest? And I wonder if the other teams are going to test that out today as well. So you've got the likes of Richie Port. I won't scroll further down, but you've got also the likes of uh, Lopez as well, who's um, who, who could potentially go early. But back to the quickly back to back to the. So, I don't even know. I mean, it's such a difficult stage to call. But one thing that I hope is that we get a very strong break with a few fringe GC men. Guys, you can't afford to let beat you on the stage by six, seven, ten minutes up there because that will force the race from behind. It's going to mean we're going to get some very tired legs on this final, on these final climbs and plenty of action. Of course, the fact that we don't have a summit finish means we go downhill. There's uh, likely rain about as well. So, you know, if the GC guys are together, you know, they... There is a chance they, that you know the, the race could be a neutralizer bit there, but I don't see that happening. I think they're going to be spread out across the final climb, and I think we're going to get big action 
on the run in uh, down to the finish. Who am I picking to win the race? Well, let's have a look and see. Let's pop to the betting there. And uh, stage eight of the Tour de France, you've got Tadej Pajakar here at 11 to 2. Now, if it all comes together at the end, he's a, he's obviously the favorite for the stage. He can win in a sprint finish out of a small group. But you know what? I think Pajakar today is generally going to be in defensive mode. Maybe on the final climb, he'll attack. But uh, quite possibly, there would have been some early attackers anyway up the road ahead of him there. I wouldn't be backing him at 11 to 2. But then again, if you've been following these previews, you know my Tour de France form. And if I was you, I'd be <laughs> going against whatever I say. Because frankly, as much as I love this race, and as you can hear, probably I'm excited for the stage. Financially, it hasn't been my best. Richard Carapaz, he's 11 to 1 for the stage. Uh, I think he'll be tightly marked by Podrakar today. Uh, yeah, I'd probably... I'm not saying he can't win it as well, but but it's also not not not, not in my staking plan. Uh, Ala Philippe, twelve to one. He hasn't shown the best legs to date. He has won this on this finish before. He's definitely, if he's at his best, can win the stage. But I'm just not convinced. Uh, if, certainly, if he's with the GC guys, that he'll have the strength to go away from them. Perhaps if he manages to infiltrate a break, uh, I don't think he's got the strength to go too long here. Though. Michael Woods, a lot of people fancying him. He's 12 to 1. He's certainly got the ability and he's going to be given the leeway to get into the break as well. Lopez, right. Time to bring up my first uh, bet of the stage. And it's a Lopez. I'm going two units to win. I'm chained uh, on, on these stages. I'm not getting involved in too many riders. I'm putting my head down and I'm saying, come on, Lopez, bring it home. Lopez is quite capable of going early. But at the same time, I, I would could see him going on, for example, the penultimate climb. And Podjakar, at the end of the day, is not going to is not going to respond um, to Lopez straight away. He doesn't have to. Lopez is quite far behind him. Unless Lopez infiltrates the break, which is possible, then he suddenly becomes a threat again. And that's why I'm hoping the likes of Movi Star, Stan, and them also try and get as many guys into the break as possible. Is a gear at twenty to one? This man loves riding in the wet. Certainly can't be ignored. But I'm going to go a little bit further down for my next pick. You guys might even know who it is already from the way I've been speaking so far. And where is he? There he is. Richie Port at 40 to 1. Uh, and he's not actually on your screen because I'm covering it with a with a banner. But Richie Port there at 40 to 1. Uh, he's my pick. I think Port, I think I think Ineos have got to try something from him. You know, you could argue there's two weeks left. Now is the time to strike and try and hurt Podjikar. Make no mistake, I love Podjikar. I think he's great. I backed him last year. But from the race's point of view, ultimately. I want to see excitement and I want to see Podjiko and his team put under pressure. So Richie Port there at 40 to 1. Like Lopez, I think he can win by getting into the, the break and winning from that. But I also think he can win with a late attack if he's, he's got the legs. Because if it gets to that stage, Podjiko will be prepared to give him some rain. He's going to have all eyes on a Carapaz, no doubt about that. Well, I've waffled on. This is definitely the longest preview. I somehow knew it would be because... I'm really, really excited for this one. It's going to be a cracking stage. It starts around 1 o'clock South African time. I'm not even going to worry about rugby in that this afternoon. It's all about the Tour de France. And we'll see you tomorrow for the Stage 9 preview. Have a cracking day.